This is a mechanical computer which I'm currently building. It's loosely based on the electronic Manchester small-scale experimental machine, sometimes called the Manchester Baby, made in 1948. It uses ball bearings for data and it gets a lot closer to what we might consider a traditional von Neumann architecture than some of the earlier Turing machines or other automata. It's not finished at the moment, there are quite a few bits left to build and making it reliable will be a big challenge. Ball bearings represent data. If a ball bearing is present, that's a 1. If there's no ball bearing, that's a 0. The hopper at the top of the machine injects ball bearings into each column when requested. There's a button on the front, but these are meant to be controlled by levers at the back, which connect to other parts of the machine. This is the memory unit. It's an 8x8 grid, that is, it stores 8 bytes of data, and in its default state, ball bearings fall straight through the machine without affecting any of the data in it. To read data from memory, I can push one row from the right, then retract from the right, and the data falls out from that row. Then I can reset everything from the left. To write something back into memory, I'm going to pick another row and push that to the left again, but not retract it this time. Now I can add some more data from the top of the machine. And when I reset everything from the left, that data is stored, and now data can pass through that column again without affecting any of the stored data. The data we read earlier is gone from memory. We call that a destructive read. There's a way to address that, which we'll come to later. The next question is, how do we decide which row we're going to use? This is the address decoder with uh, 8 outputs of memory here, 0 to 7. And lower down, we have an expansion space for another 8 words of memory, so we can go up to 16 bytes for this machine. This is the decoder mounted on the machine at the moment. And this is an animation of the address decoder using just 3 bits of address space, so there are 8 possible outputs. There are 3 thin plates, made from acrylic in my machine, which have different patterns carved in them, and these get layered on top of each other, or one behind the other. Now we'll add some labels so we can see what's going on. At the moment we can only see the number 0 through the plates, but if I move one of the inputs to the left, then output 1 is uncovered, that's the least significant bit. If I slide the next one on its own we see 2, and if I slide the final one we see 4. The plates can be moved independently, so if we move all of them we'll move up to 6, and then 7. The value of the plates are added together and only one output is uncovered at a time. To use this, we have rods at the top which can fall into the gap. So here, the rod above output 7 can fall, maybe under gravity or a, a spring, and that activates something appropriate to output 7. If we try to move the inputs while the output is active, the rods are going to block movement. So normally, the rods normally have to be held up towards the top of the decoder. With them all raised, we can move the inputs again. This is how the decoder looks when it's removed from the machine. We have outputs 0 to 9 in place, the space for 16 outputs in total, and we have a mechanism to lift all output rods at once. And we'd only drop these output rods for a short period. And if I move the input rods, we can choose a different output. So now 1 can drop and 0 is held. Move another rod, and we move on to output 3, and again up to 7, and reset all the input rods to get us back to 0. There's a further mechanism at the top of the machine which can lift up all of the input rods at once. The idea here is to lift all the rods and then allow some of them to drop under gravity. So these would fall down if there's no ball bearing to block them. Next is a thing called the regenerator. This is our copying unit or ball bearing sensor unit. The main use is to replace data that has been read from memory, hence the term regenerator. When the front bar drops, you can see some clear levers at the back of the machine. None of those have been raised up at the moment.
but if I drop ball bearings into some columns and then drop the bar again, some of those levers are raised up. They raise in the columns which have ball bearings. Those raised levers activate other parts of the machine, for example, injecting more ball bearings back into memory in those columns. Now when I raise the front bar, the ball bearings fall out, and when I drop the bar again, you'll see no levers are raised. The ball bearings that fell out are still data though, those go on to other parts of the machine. The accumulator is like a combination of adding unit and a register. There are two of these accumulator units, the main accumulator unit of the machine and another one for the program counter. The red plastic parts are the main accumulator and in front of it in blue is the program counter. So these both store the value of the accumulator and program counter and allow us to either subtract from the accumulator or add to the program counter. This is a close-up of the first few bits. If I drop a ball into column 1, the blue toggle moves and the ball bearing falls out and is discarded. If I drop another one in, the toggle moves back, but now the ball bearing cascades into the second bit, a carry operation. Now we're at 3. Now we're at 4. And we don't have to drop into the first column, we can drop into column 4. Adding 8. To read data, we use a second layer. Now this has toggles with no arms on them, so they don't update the state. If I drop a bearing into this layer, it gets diverted right. And gets discarded. But if that first bit was set to 1, then a ball bearing dropped into the same read column gets diverted left, and that goes on to the address decoder. So if we drop ball bearings into all the read columns at once, we read out the value of the accumulator without affecting its value. If this mechanism looks a bit familiar, it might be because the Turing tumble uses a very similar mechanism, although the actual mechanism goes back to at least 1965 with the Digicomp 2. My accumulators have 8 bits in total. This could be extended up to 32 bits, which is what the original Manchester machine used. So that covers most of the data path parts of the machine. The next part is our sequencer, and this controls all the actions that have to happen at different times during an instruction cycle, every lever that has to be pulled at a specific point. In its most basic form, it's just a very large cam system. As we rotate this, there are bumps on these acrylic cams which raise up and cause certain actions to happen in other parts of the machine. This goes round once every instruction cycle and would probably be a lot slower than this in reality. One catch though is that sometimes some of those actions are conditional. We don't do every action every cycle. On some instructions we do a certain thing, on other instructions we omit it. So we have our instruction decoder as part of the sequencer. This looks a great deal like the memory address decoder and is based on similar ideas. The key thing here is that this is only allowing one cam follower to drop for each instruction. There are eight possible instructions for this machine, so there are three bits which control it, and they allow one of these levers to fall on each instruction cycle. Instruction cams fall into a gap rather than being pushed up by a bump. This instruction cam is falling into the gap there, and that will cause an action somewhere. But if we change the setup for those instruction decoder levers, now that old instruction is selected, so it can't fall down significantly into that gap. So if this was the store lever, and we're not doing a store this instruction, that action doesn't happen. The instruction decoder can be set up just from ball bearings falling through. The mass of them is enough to move the levers. And these ball bearings came from the instruction we read out of memory earlier. And then, once per cycle, one of the ordinary cams can reset all of these back to their original position. So what's next? At the moment, this is a collection of parts which prove a principle. I need to connect these parts together, probably using Bowden cable or string. But making them work once for a video is not going to be enough. These things need to work reliably hundreds of times for the machine as a whole to function. But I think it's about halfway there.